Excellent. Are you guys all black? Oh, sorry. Pardon? I was just going, are we, are we live? Yes, we are live now. Okay. Sorry for the wobbly thing. Oh, I'm perfect. holding the phone in my hand. That's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. I, I'm just glad we managed to get this um, organized and going because uh, it was good of you to make the time. Hopefully, oh, uh, next time when you're in Italy, we'd like to host you here in person. Uh, you know, it's it's a beautiful city. I, I, I know you've been to Naples before, but. Uh, uh, the, the Orientale is one of the oldest seats of Oriental studies in Europe and uh, as such has a very nice Indology department. Oh, so, right, right. So, but where are you guys? You're right now, are you back on campus? Kind of a mix. So yeah. I'll, I'll let Stefania answer that. Okay. <laughs> Stefania, are you back on campus now? Or? Uh, actually, we don't, uh, the, the problem is that we don't have a campus. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I see. So, there's a, so we have, uh, as we have a, a law, first of all, and uh, I'm very happy to, um, to, to uh, have you uh, as our guest tonight, just before starting, um, as uh, our university is uh, such an old university, we kept uh, this very ancient building from the uh, uh, 16th, 17th century in the city center. So we don't really have a campus. Right, right. We okay. live nearby in the city center. So Oh, I see. I see. We will host you. We, we will welcome you in the city center, not in the <laughs> campus. So right, you will right, right. Be our guest. Uh, most of the buildings around 16th century, 15th century, and wow. century buildings. So right, right. you don't miss having a campus. Uh, yeah, I see. yes, yes. Uh, so uh, yeah, but but yeah, students have come back. Uh, teachings resumed in person, so we're no longer yeah. uh, COVID. COVID. Uh, it's life is almost normal, and we hope it'll continue. So after September, because uh, the past two years we've now uh, gathered this. Uh, steam of you know summer becomes normal-ish mm -hmm. and then September October again uh, there's a lot of worry about what happens so uh, right right so uh, we, we have around 55 people so I think it's a good time to start um, mm -hmm. good evening everybody buonasera a tutti good morning uh, to Mr. Chandra in uh, California um, and today is a very special day because I have very few heroes and uh, Vikram Chandra is one of them. Um, so I'm very glad he made the time to speak with us. Um, uh, today is also by pure coincidence Rabindra Jayanti. So um, it is the anniversary of another very prolific and famous Indian author. So it's, it's, it's a very good day, to, very auspicious day to have you with us. Um, that said, uh, let me, uh, Mr. Chandra needs no introduction. He teaches creative writing at the University of California. Uh, he's the author of uh, Red Earth and Pouring Grain, as well as the more recently famous Sacred Games. Um, today will be just a conversation, an informal conversation. So uh, while our normal formats are where people speak for a while, this will be a conversation between me and uh, you and uh, if anybody would like to ask questions, kindly raise your hand and I will make sure that uh, we have you um, promoted to a speaker and the panelists also can ask questions whenever they feel like it. So we can have this a little more informal as a conversation. So welcome Vikram and um, good to have you with us and hope you have good weather in California because we've started rains again after 10 days of wonderful weather. So uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and, and uh, for all your kind words. Um, I'd like to start with uh, I'm, I'm, my personal obsession is Bombay based literature. And I grew up in Bombay of the 90s and the 80s. So uh, start off with Salman Rushdie's Moor's Last Sai, Red Suketu Mehta's Maximum City. But Sacred Games took it to a fully new level. And uh, what I read was you spent 10 years writing the book. 
So, uh, you know, while we we'll talk about the web series a little later, my obsession has been the book and I've read it several times over several geographies. So I'd love for you to tell us something about the book, what inspired you to write it and something behind the process of writing uh, Sacred Games as a book in general. Um, so, yeah, that's a long, uh, that was a long trek to get the book, book finished. So what happened was that um, in the, so when I was growing up, of course, there was crime you know, in every Indian city, but it was sort of very local and small, right? So there would be the, maybe the neighborhood tough guys, there would be the pickpockets, you know, stuff like that. And then in the 80s, um, it, we, you could tell that, that things were getting much more organized, right? And there was very famously a man called uh, Dawood Ibrahim, uh, the son of a policeman, right? Who, who <clears throat> came in and, to put it very simply, he started making it a corporate business, right? So he started expanding his power and the other gangs were given the choice of you either join us or you get crushed, right? And he started getting bigger and bigger. And when I say corporate, I mean that very exactly, right? That uh, they structured themselves, you know, with managers and the executives higher up. And in Bombay, these guys were actually called companies, right? The gangs were no longer gangs, they were companies. So Dawood's company was called the D company company, right? Um, and the effect of it was that you could see um, that suddenly as they started to try and grab for the growing pie because of the economy slowly getting better, um, the, the, this, you know, from sort of seeing it in the movies, we started to have gunfights on the streets, right? Um, and there was a very famous um, shootout. Um, the, the police cornered these uh, fairly well-known shooters in a building. And my father and I, we lived in the north of Bombay and we were coming home from town one day and there was a lot, there's a long main street among this very densely uh, populated area where there were these tall apartment buildings on either side. And suddenly we hear automatic weapons gunfire echoing off the buildings, right? And we were like, what the hell's going on? And later we learned that about, you know, what had happened and then my friend Hussein Zedi, who's a who's a crime journalist, wrote that up um, as an article, and then in, in his books, and then was finally made into a Bollywood film called Shootout at Lokanwala, right? Um, and then you could see also the increasing influence of these people in politics, um, um, especially in in Bombay. You know, real estate is is very difficult because it's an island, right? And as the city grew and its economy grew. Um, just land and and real estate became enormously important and of course these guys had a you know their all their fingers in the real estate business right so uh, and then they started to uh, as happens everywhere um the one of the main avenues of uh, revenue was extortion right and the film industry has famously been a soft target for extortion um and uh I don't know if your audience will know this. My family is very involved in the film industry in Bombay. My mother is a screenwriter. Uh, one of my sisters is a director and writer. The other sister is a film journalist who's married to a producer director. So my brother-in-law um, is very well known and he started getting these calls. So the way it works is, uh, it used to work is that if you're a film producer, uh, like a month before your big movie was releasing, you would get a phone call. Actually, you might get several phone calls. And somebody would say, so-and-so bhai. Bhai actually means brother, but it's the Bombay parlance for made guy, right? So so-and-so bhai wants you to deliver these many suitcases of cash, you know, in two or three weeks at this place, otherwise we'll kill you, right? So my brother-in-law is kind of crazy. So he got a couple of these phone calls and he essentially told them to fuck off, right? And what that meant was one day, um, you know, I go and visit them and there's a armed police guards outside their building. And they lived for a couple of years like that. So I started to wonder, and you know, there were other people that I knew in the film industry. One of friend of mine who refused to pay up was actually shot um, and he barely survived. So I started to wonder how this was going on, right? Why it was going on. And I started to 
investigate. Oh, and I should say that in before Sacred Games, I'd published a collection of short stories called uh, Love and Longing in Bombay. And in that, I had written um, basically a detective story with a cop a policeman as the investigator, which was Sartad Singh. Right. And so I knew this world slightly. I had met my uh, journalist friend, Hussein Zaidi, while I was writing that book. So I just started to ask people, like, can you introduce me to anybody who can talk to me about this or who's involved in this? Um, and as I started writing the book, I mean, <clears throat> of course, I should have realized earlier, um, it was kind of silly of me to not understand this, that you cannot have organized crime without active collusion with politicians, with the local politics and the larger politics, right? And if the system really wanted to crush organized crime, they could, but they don't because there's mutual exchange of value. So suddenly from writing, I, I thought at the beginning that I was writing like a 220 page thriller, right? With a dead body or a couple of dead bodies at the beginning. And then, you know, um, you would know by the end why they had got killed and who the killer was. Um, but then I, you know, in short order, I figured out that, okay, I'm writing a book about politics as well. And as all of you will know that you cannot write about politics in modern India without writing about religion as well, right? And so suddenly I'm writing religion and then there's, uh, there's uh, there was a moment I was talking to a senior cop in Bombay and asking him questions about all of this. And he said, look, you'll never understand what's actually going on in a larger sense unless you go to Delhi and talk to X and Y. And the X and Y that he was talking about were people in the intelligence services. And so what, what happens in the subcontinent and in other places in the world is that these companies, these gangs, the larger organized crime units are used by the intelligence agencies to conduct operations that they can disown, right? It's plausible deniability. And these people have structures that spread across borders, right? So if you're trying to move men and material into some other country, who better to ask than somebody who's already an expert at this? Um, and in, in, in the subcontinent, obviously the main conflict, the, the huge conflict that's been going on for 70 years is India and Pakistan, right? <laughs> so all of a sudden, I'm also writing a spy novel, right? And that's how it started to get larger and larger. And that's why it took that long, right? Um, 10 years. Um, I'll ask you another question. It's, it's rather my observation. So you could completely tell me if I was wrong. You've tried, I don't know if you tried to, but it's ended up becoming a kind of a modern Mahabharata. And... <laughs> Um, you know, you, you, you put a very nice title to it, which is Sacred Games, which kind of, you know, if you look at the Mahabharata, it's also a very sacred game and it's, 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 it's all intertwined and then it becomes one big uh, connection to another. So was this intentional or was this you just following your nose as a writer and this just grow over time? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think when you start, you never know what you're doing, right? But uh, I mean, I think what I was doing very consciously from fairly early on was using the circular structure, of, which is so common to Indian, many Indian epics, right? Um, so I knew where I was starting, where I would end up. And then as I was starting to write across all these various domains, you know, crime and politics and all of that, um, one of the things that grew on me is this kind of networked effect, right? And also the, this recognition on my part is that our lives, our individual lives are, you know, the lives on my street are very affected by something that goes on on the other side of the world, right? Um, and, and like, for instance, in India, you know, what happens on the border in Kashmir might show up six months later as something that is connected to on my street. But for the large part, none of us can ever understand all of these threads that move through um, our individual lives. So I, I realized that's what was slowly happening. And then, especially in the later drafts, I could then start to knit it all together, right? And then, like I said, um, because I understood that religion was going to be a large part of the book, I I don't know if it was consciously modeled on... Uh, I, I, I didn't, um, 
I don't think I, I consciously shaped it after the Mahabharata or the Ramayana, but except that this notion of, um, of connectedness, of large things that are going on that actually end up um, introducing conflict or love or whatever into our smaller lives. Uh, okay. um, another question, uh, Sartat Singh, I mean, you mentioned that you, you, you'd written a story about him. I, I haven't read your uh, short stories, so I should actually catch up, but have you modeled him after somebody specific or is he just a mix of Bombay in general and why the Sikh? Was it because, <laughs> you know, uh, right. any reason, specific reason to why Sikh? Well, so I, you know, I never know where characters come from. Right. So when I started <clears throat> writing <clears throat> that story in Love and Longing, um, I knew that I, I mean that the structure of that book is that it's five short stories, each written in a form that I really love. Right. So I love detective fiction. Um, there's a kind of uh, there's a ghost story in there. There's a story. There's a love story and so forth. So I knew I wanted to do do a detective fiction, a policia essentially, mm. and then. I don't know from where he came, right? And if I try and you know, kind of do a post-game analysis, um, I had Sikh friends when I was growing up, of course, and and you know he's kind of a dandy, he's very good looking, and looking back, I I remember, you know that that uh, I was at boarding school and I saw one of my friend's fathers, and he was a very good looking Sikh, and what I noticed was that you know he was in a suit. And he had a pocket handkerchief, you know, the pocket square. So when you tie a turban, there's an outer turban, and mm -hmm. then there's an inner, I don't know, in Hindi, we call it a patka. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can see a little triangle of that inner um, cloth. So this part of his turban matched his pocket handkerchief, which matched his tie, which matched his socks. Wow. Right? And I was like, that is like awesome. I've remembered that all my <laughs> life, right? So maybe Sartaj came from there. At my school, there was a boy who was like three or four years senior to me, and he was called, uh, his name was Sartaj. But actually, I don't know, Sartaj just appeared somewhere out of this mix, right? Um, and, and I think, I mean, and he was already a Sardar, a Sikh, right? So again, I started writing, and then I realized that this is actually kind of useful because in the structure of the Bombay department, he's very unusual, right? Um, They've only, as far as I know, I mean, the people that I've known and met, there've been like three Sikhs in all my life, maybe four. And, you know, the Bombay Police Department has like 30 to 40,000 policemen in it, right? So it, it's quite rare. So, but the usefulness to me is that he's kind of on the outside um, and there's all these intricate inner politics, regional politics that take place among various, um, I guess you would call them caste groups right, within the police department, but he's one step outside of all of those. Right? Well, because, you know, one thing I noticed, and this is me growing up in Bombay in the 80s and the early 90s, I left in 95, um, was that your uh, central police character revolves around Parulkar, and Parulkar is a Maharashtrian, mm. upper caste Brahmin, which is, you know, majority of the, the, the Mumbai police hierarchy, you would probably find a Parukar, but around him, you have the Majid Khan and the Sartat Singh characters. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I was wondering whether this was specifically to bring in those different points of view, or this just happened because, you know, these were the odd guys. Well, I think, I mean, you can see this, right? It is in some sense, it's very heavily dominated by Maharashtrian Brahmins and Marathas, right? But you, it is a multicultural force, right? And actually, I have to say at the upper levels, so uh, the upper levels above, uh, I guess you would, the equivalent would be above the rank of, uh, rank of sergeant. Actually, um, in Italy, you would know this, right? Like you have inspectors and senior inspectors right. who are kind of like the enlisted force. And then the Indian police service, which is the sort of elite officer thing, mm -hmm. that's a national service, right? And those guys are all recruited from, it's a national examination, right? So that tends to be more varied, but it, it, it is a, even at the, the enlisted level, it is a multicultural force, right? You do see policemen. I think I've met more Muslims in, in at that rank than I have um, Sikhs, of course. Yeah. I mean, because there's a, a quite sizable Muslim minority 
in Bombay as well, right? So people come from that. Maharashtra Muslim minority is is quite yeah. sizable. So, so actually, at, at the Havaldar levels, the, the the lowest levels, the constabulary, as you would have called it in the British Times, you'd probably have quite a, yes. quite a big bunch of Muslims, etc. Right. Uh, I kind of, uh, and this is again my observations. Again, last time I read the book completely was several years ago. Um, <laughs> You have very few Parsi characters, even though they dominate, or they did dominate at least in in the 80s and the 90s, they did dominate the Bombay scene, even until 2010 or so, they did dominate the economic scene. Why was that? Is that any specific yeah, reason? I mean, I guess I guess numerically one should point out that they're very small, right? But they because of the I mean, during the colonial times, um, they were commercially economically very important right like some of the larger kind of huge business um, interest companies the tatas and so forth were were parsi right godrej and so forth i think like you said over time they've become less um economically sort of present but also culturally it seems to me that from that time where they were you know building museums and so forth um, in the movie industry, for instance, or uh, national media, you know, the newscasters, I've started to see less of them, right? So I suppose it's some kind of reflection of that, right? Uh, although, although the, I mean, in, in my fiction, I guess, as you show up in the book of short stories, one of the short stories is, um, is uh, the protagonist is a Parsi um, officer, right? Uh, a very uh, famous Parsi officer in the Indian Army. I mean, fiction that is not in, not in real life, right? Although again, um, the Indian army has had some very prominent Parsi uh, people in it. You have Zam McIntyre, one of the bigger names. Right, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, just move over to the web series. And uh, first question, you, you are the executive producer of, of the web right. series as well. Uh, the process of converting a 600 page, I think, novel to, uh, a two season series um, 900 right? 900. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> a 900 page novel to a two season web series um, tell us something about that please yeah i mean you know um it's been an interesting trip so the the, the um when the book came out actually before it was published um people won um you know, what happens in the publishing industry is before a book comes out and if it gets some buzz come going around it, the the film and TV scouts also sort of pick up the buzz and you start getting, my agent started getting calls. And I actually um, had a meeting in LA with one of the principals in um, a really, really well-known um, uh, movie company that you guys will know of. Um, and they make amazing films, right? Like not just in the commercial sense, but smaller indie movies that win Oscars and stuff. So my agent told me to go and meet him and I did, and we had lunch, I liked him a lot. And he wanted to option the book. And I'm like, okay, you guys are crazy. You wanna make a movie out of this? I mean, even if it's a three hour movie, I don't quite understand, but okay. And then they hired a very um, renowned, um, British screenwriter and playwright to do the adaptation. And apparently he went nuts over a couple, two and a half years trying to do it. And it kept for one reason or the other not working. And so um, now this was a time 2007, you know, prestige television series had already started. The Sopranos was out and that always made more sense to me. Um, and then uh, a producer asked my agent and I think it was 2014, um, if you know can we try and sell this in hollywood as a series now and by that time netflix had proved its model of you know um make local and sell global right narcos was already out that proved that you could make a series in another language than english and have international you know uh, viewership for it so then we spent like two or three years in what is called development hell right we were optioned by a very prominent um, company and then we you know you write and write drafts again they keep giving you notes finally ended up not getting made by them but because we were doing the rounds of hollywood 
we had had meetings at Netflix and that's when it got, um, they finally decided, yeah, they were going to give green light it, right? Um, and I should say that executive producer in the movie industry, some of your audience who've been involved will know that executive producer is a throwaway title, right? It's like, it can mean absolutely anything, right? <laughs> so what that meant for me was that they were writing it. I teach here in California at Berkeley. So um, the writer's room was in Bombay and, you know, they were working on drafts and they would send me drafts of the episodes and I would then like really pepper them with suggestions and comments and, um, you know, which some of which get taken and some of it obviously don't, right? I mean, in the movie business, the person whose book it's based on has the least power in that st structure, right? Uh, which is actually as it should be, right? Because film is a very, very different medium, right? Uh, you cannot make a 900 page book and be faithful to it, right? In a kind of literal sense. And especially if you're making uh, a thriller, right? So, I mean, uh, when the book first came out in India, um, my publishers were talking it up as a thriller. And I was like, how can there be a 900 page thriller, right? Because <laughs> it's a very slow burn book, right? Uh, I mean, I, what interested me is about this, we live with the fear of conflict and especially nuclear conflict in the world. and it's always present in India, you know, um, if things can go wrong at very short notice, right? Because there are two hostile military forces facing at each other at sometimes like a 50 foot distance, right? Um, so what I was interested in is this, like how we live in fear, but then we forget the fear, right? And then suddenly there's a terrorist act, right? Something gets blown up and then that shatters into our ordinary daily lives. So that was what my assumption was, right? And Netflix wanted to make a thriller. So of course they had to change it and then also change it for the way of making it uh, something that works in the film medium, right? Uh, I mean, you remember from the book that uh, that Sartaj gets, keeps getting stuck in traffic jams right, in Bombay, so, which, is, which happens every day to all of us, right? So you can't put a cop in a thriller in a traffic jam for like 10 minutes. <laughs> so all of those changes happen. They change the characters. They introduced, you know, um, one of the characters, Cuckoo, uh, who's, uh, she's a transsexual. Uh, in the book, she does never appears on stage. There, there's just these two policemen on stakeout uh, who are telling a story about her. And, you know, they found that one mention of her and made her a major part of the series. And, and you know, Kubra Seth, who's the actress, did a wonderful job. And, you know, so, so that kind of thing I could never have done, right? Because in my head, it's still the novel. Right. And I, there needed to be eyes that were seeing it from outside. Uh, my question to you, I mean, it's probably an unfair question, but um, how satisfied are you with the web series vis-a-vis -vis the book? I mean, I think they did a fantastic job, right? I mean, and and all of us, you know, it was the first Netflix series and we were all trying to do a good job of it, but we never expected the kind of reception that it got in India and then also outside India, right? And it pops up in the most interesting places. One of my uh, school friends is a senior guy in this, um, uh, one of those New York uh, venture fund kind of places, right? And his boss, you know, uh, who's very American, East Coast, waspy guy, suddenly comes up to him one day and, you know, he's saying this to him because he's Indian. And he said, hey, I just saw this series called Sacred Games. It was, uh, you know, I really liked it, right? So, you know, for us to imagine that uh, what we were doing in Bombay would be watched like somebody like him, we had never imagined that, right? We we hoped that it would be successful in India and we had a fair amount of confidence that people would watch it, but not this global thing, right? Uh, you've used all the minor Asura stories, um, you know, Atapi Vatapi as, as, as your episode names throughout the two seasons. Is that was something that came from your end or was that uh, uh, your screenwriters in Bombay? That was that was the writer's room, right? I mean, I, I mean, when we started talking about it, you know, 
in especially in our earlier discussions, we did, you know, we had a talk about, you know, Ashwatthama, right? Who's a character from the Mahabharata who's immortal. Um, and we talked about him. I talked a lot about him as a metaphor for Gaitonde, right? Who's the ultimate survivor. His first name is Ganesh, you know, who's the who's the uh, God that you pray to when you set out any on any venture. And he seems immortal, right? All the way till the end. So, so I think this idea of using these old structures which Indians know really intimately, right? Like it's it's kind of astonishing how much these epics still are in our consciousness, both unconsciously, but also very consciously, very politically. And, and obviously in India are being exploited shamelessly <laughs> nowadays for political reasons, right? So so I, I think that was that layering that they did was amazing. And I think, you know, m- most credit should go absolutely to them, all credit. Right? Uh, any comments on a season three? I am no. I mean, the writer, the book writer, is always the last one to know, right? So I have no idea what's happening. Right? But would you personally like to see a season three? I would like to see seven seasons, right? Because you know, because uh, yeah, because there's so much more to explore, right? I mean, one of the things I should also say is that uh, in the Indian political environment right now, it's become harder and harder, not just for us, but any film producer today or director or writer to do something that might offend the power, the political powers that be, but also this, you know, the Indian right wing, which insists on getting offended by everything. <laughs> and so, so, you know, especially in terms of religion, right? Like, uh, and I think uh, b- way back in 2015 and 16, because streaming had just started in India in a big way, we were able to get away with a lot more than right now what people can do in India, right? Um, the sort of the the government machinery has caught up with it. There's calls for censorship, you know. Um, they, they You can actually, well, one of the strangest things about India is that I, as an individual sitting in a small town in in uh, in somewhere in the north of India, if I get offended by something in in a film or something, I can file a police case, yeah. right? Uh, first, uh, it's called the first information report and FIR. And I say I'm offended and I want a court case against them. And then the cops, if they accept the FIR, will show up in Bombay <laughs> wanting to arrest you, right? And, right. and take you back to face, you know, to defend yourself in some Northern court. So people are terrified. I mean, I can report from inside the Bombay film industry that everyone has drawn back and you think, you know, 50 times before you put anything slightly sensitive into, into a script. Yeah. Uh, the choice of um, Saif Ali Khan to play, play Sertaj, uh, are you satisfied with uh, the character that he's played? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think both of them did a terrific job, he and Nawazuddin um, Siddiqui. Um, And I think what they both brought apart from acting is that they, I mean, I think film stars have this presence on the screen that we often tend to discount, right? We say so-and-so film star always plays himself or herself on the screen. but what we don't realize is that happens because of this intense, I think it's almost inborn capacity. When they're in front of the camera, they eat up the camera, right? The camera eats them up and you can't look away from them, right? And I got a very, I mean, um, I went to film school for one year in New York at Columbia and Milo Schwarman was the director of the program. And uh, I unfortunately never got to take a class with him, but he gave a lecture to the incoming would-be directors and um, filmmakers. We were expected to make movies of our own, right? And he talked about this, right? That he said, like, if you take somebody like, uh, you know, Clint Eastwood or on the Indian side, Shah Rukh Khan or Hrithik Roshan, you know, whatever they're able to do in terms of acting is one thing, but the presence of a film star, a star, in your film does something else that is potentially magical, right? And both of them, I think, um, Seth and Nawaz brought that presence um, to the screen. Right? 
I'll, I'll go back to the book for a minute and uh, let's talk about the most famous part, uh, not the most, but the more important part of the book, which is this Swami, this God man. <laughs> Uh, uh, I mean, the, when I read it, 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 it started reminding me of Ch Osho and Chandraswami, and then it went straight mm -hmm. up to, you know, it kind of progressed from there. But yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have any specific models on, on whom you model this uh, character? Or Well, you know, I mean, I'm glad you brought up Chandraswami, because I think in today's India, he is quite forgotten, right? Which is incredible. Um, I, you know, I, your audience might not know. So this is another god man, right? Way back, started getting like popular in the 70s. He was close to the political powers at the time, so he would show up on television, giving you yoga and spiritual lessons, and he became nationally famous. And then, you know, politicians would go to him; they would want to be seen with this guy. And then it turned out that he was this is a sort of whole sidebar story that. He was close to Adnan Khashoggi, who was a global weapons mover kind of guy, a weapons czar, right? One of these guys, international weapons traders. Amazing, right? So I, I, I'm sure that he was in my, somewhere in the back of my head. And then also, you know, locally, I mean, by local, I mean, you know, your friend's friend's aunt always has this guru that she's going on about, right? And and so forth. So I, I think the... Um, while I was writing the book, I tried my best to meet every such person, man or woman or child that I could, right? Um, and so somehow out of a mixture of all these big and small came Guruji. Right? And, and, and Guruji seems to have this uh, kind of unexplained presence where, I mean, I would have expected Guruji to have a little more foreign influence on him because you know, when you saw Chandraswami from the Narsimha Rao era, the liberalization, I mean, for me, that's the reference point. The three most important things that shaped modern India were Babri Masjid, the Bombay mm -hmm. bomb blasts, and then the stock market scandal, uh, mm -hmm. the liberalization thing. I mean, that was my Bombay for me. So uh, you must forgive me if I take you back there. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I would have expected a lot more even in the book, uh, you you keep him international because you know you you have all these mentions to his foreign businesses and whatever else, but you don't show foreign political influence on him. What would we expect? Is that purposefully done, or have you just tried to keep it simple? No, I mean I think not all of them have that, right? So if you look at the current models, right, Sri Sri, you know, who's some like present guy. What's the other guy's name? Um, the mystic dude, you know, with the really beautiful clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know what you're talking about. Um, uh, anyway, it's anyway. okay. Anyway. It'll come back to me, obviously, after the end of this discussion. So these guys are close to politicians that in, in the sense that you will see them in the same circles because they're so influenced and famous and globally famous in a sense. Uh, but you know, they, I, you know, I don't know any current guy who has that kind of Adnan Khashoggi connection, right? right? And and nor somebody who is seen necessarily, you know, uh, I mean, you know, they would they love having a picture with Obama or something like that, right? But as in the foreign influence, you would never want to make that obvious now, right? Uh, because there's this whole nationalistic thing, you know. We're always talking about something goes wrong in India, or it's the foreign hand. Yes. Right? Some enemy of ours, whether it's the United States or somebody else, is trying to do something really bad, right? Um, they're trying to disrupt our economy or whatever. So you never want to do that. You don't want to get close to that. Right. Um, a last question. This whole closing of the book, which was, which to me was the most touching part of it, which was the ISI guy's mother and Sartaj Singh's mother being related. Mm -hmm. um, it's also very coincidental that Saif Ali Khan has relatives who are on the yeah. other side of the border with very senior. I see that as a more sacred game kind of a thing, but um, yeah. how, how did you think of that kind of an ending? I mean, uh, that, was well, it, that was always somehow, you know, sometimes even though you don't know what the middle of the book is, you know what the end of the book is, right? And I knew that that was going to happen, right? Uh, that's why, you know, early on in the book, there's a whole uh, chapter which is about Sartaj's mother remembering partition and what happened to her during partition. And so that was written really early. It's pretty early in the book, okay. right? 
So, so that I knew was happening. And, you know, it's an obvious thing. Like you were saying, so many of us have family or friends of family who suffered partition, right? And it's the large generation that my parents that actually can remember that firsthand. So I'd grown up with these stories all my life, right? Um, and also, like you were talking about the Mahabharat, that's the center of it, right? It's cousins fighting each other, right? And in some sense, that's the stupidity of what we've been doing for the last 70 years, right? And even before that, we are the same people, right? We might have different religious practice, but we share the same culture, the same food, the same music, right? And I think in some sense, the fights between brothers and sisters are the worst, right? And and that's what's happened to us. So that you know, on a metaphorical level, that also was something that was very obvious to me. Because you know, when you do did announce Sarta, uh, Saif Ali Khan was going to play Sartaj, to me it was like you know, it kind of closed a circle. And I'm not saying this negatively. Yeah. I'm actually saying this positively mm. because I think he could actually relate to that kind of a character who right uh, to kind of face with. It, it, it's tough to live with. I mean, and you, yeah. you know, lives on the other side of the border. I'm sure, it's it's quite challenging to live with. Um, that said. In, in general, I'd just like to talk to you about creative writing. I mean, I know you teach creative writing in Berkeley and um, how, I mean, your books don't, your books always break the mold. So I read Earth, Pouring Rain, Sacred Games, you, 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 two very different. What's your process like? Is Does the story come to you or do you, do you just tell a story or does it come to you or is it carefully woven and thought of? No, I mean, no, I, I never know what the story is going to be when I start writing it, right? So always it's a character who I sometimes barely know, and it's a landscape. I know where they are, right, at the beginning, physically, I mean, right? And there's a certain mood that I know. And like I was saying, weirdly, I know the sometimes I know the mood of the end, right? And then I start writing, and it's sometimes hugely frustrating because the only way I can know what's going to happen next is by writing it, right? And so I end up down going down a long series of paths that actually end up perhaps not leading anywhere, but which become useful anyway to have explored, right? And when I finish the first draft is the first sense, or somewhere in the middle of this process or you know, three fourths through it, I start to get a se- sense of the shape of the book, right? So, so um, that at that point, I figure out, oh, maybe this is what this book is doing, right? And and then the first draft is completely ragged and misshapen, and all of those false parts are still in the draft, right? So after that, in the revisions, which I start enjoying a lot more, is like you take out and you put in, right? And and then you shape it. You're starting to be more architectural about it and you know what the character where the character is going so you're able to shape that journey as well but it's like i said it's something that and i you know i think this happens for a lot of writers right that when you start it comes from deep within you somewhere right you work with your whole body and your entire just not just the conscious part of your brain but all the unconscious parts right the deep down parts that you can never know Right. And so, and, and it's, I, I should say that people tend to think that literary writers, quote unquote, do this, and that people who work, right, in, in a quote unquote genre like detective fiction actually don't do this. I don't think that's true. Right. Um, there's a very famous, hugely successful uh, American writer. I'm, of course, going to forget his name, but he writes the Jack Reacher books. Right. You might have seen those two movies with Tom Cruise, and now there's a series on Prime. And um, there's a whole article written by John Lancaster in The New Yorker about his process, that writer's process, right? And it's amazing to think, I mean, um, (laughs) it's amazing to think that, you know, the books follow a certain ritual, right? Jack Reacher is this immensely tough, six foot six, I think he is, um, uh, ex-American serviceman who shows up in a small town um, and then there's some bad guys in that town and he kicks ass, ass and then he leaves, right? He's the, kind of the wandering cowboy. Yeah. And part of the pleasure of reading him, of reading those books is that you know the ritual is going to be followed, 
But to think of somebody like that writer who knows what he's doing in advance, he still has to discover what's going to happen, right? And um, I think that's what makes those books so effective is that when the mystery starts in the beginning, the writer doesn't know who the killer is, right? He's still figuring it out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tell me something. You do, do you have a lot of stories that never made it into the final Sacred Games draft? Yeah, like I was saying, I cut a lot away, right? And I have to say that the 900 pages part of it was, uh, I mean, I, I, the first draft was, again, I think half as long as what it is, right? So in sort of 1900, it would have been something like 1400 or something, 1500, right? So I cut and cut and cut. And um, I wanted to make it shorter, right? And my um, wife and I, my then wife and I, um, we both tried. And every time we took something out, you felt like something was being lost, right? And then I was hoping that the editors would be able to take out whole chunks and they were unable to do it either, right? So yeah, yeah, there's, there were other stories that, that didn't make it there. Right? And would you plan to publish them ever? <laughs> That would be fun. No, I think they're gone, right? I don't know. Maybe in the future, if something returns or something, sometimes, you know, you have these ideas, you make these discoveries, you meet people on one project, and then you discover them many years later, right? Actually, Sartaj is like that, right? So he appears in that one short story, and I thought I was done with him, right? And um, I was done with every other character in the book, but he's just stayed with me for some reason. And so when I started writing Sacred Games, he just appeared in the first scene, right? He was just there. I think you actually verbalize it because Gaitonde says something to the effect where he says that, you know, just when you think that you've forgotten all about it, it just comes back to you. Comes uh, back, yeah. Some, some, something, something very similar to um, that. Uh, uh, do not monopolize the conversations. Would anybody like to ask a question before I ask a few final ones? Don't feel shy. So, mm -hmm. Mita, go. Yeah, hi. Let me unmute myself. Um, uh, firstly, it's an honor to have you here with us. And uh, I've been so looking forward to this evening. I'm, I'm a great fan since I uh, read Red Earth and Pouring Rain. Uh, I think it was released in the 90s, and I was quite young then. And, um, and I've been a fan ever since. Uh, Though I love the Sacred Games book, so I'll ask you one question about Sacred Games. Um, um, was uh, Ganesh Gaitonde at all inspired by Daud Ibrahim? And why this particular profile for, uh, you know, where um, he was indoctrinated superficially into a ritualistic kind of religion and then he kind of becomes faithless uh, uh, or something like that? Right. Well, I mean, I think he, like all the other characters in the book, are mixtures of various models, right? And I think that's what writers do, and I really do, right? You you meet people, and somehow they mix together with other people, and then they show up, right? Um, and so it's hard to say, like, it wasn't a one-to-one -one kind of uh, takeoff on, on Daoud or any other pe uh, of those people. Um, and then uh, I think that's what uh, Gaitonde's journey in terms of his faith and his religion, uh, you know, there's this whole relationship with his father, who's a priest, and Sarta, I mean, uh, Gaitonde finds him contemptible, and uh, <clears throat> he becomes a kind of uh, uh, faithless person, but then he gets seduced by Guruji, right? And I think it's something that happens to all of us is that we want an ideology, right? If you want to call it that, we want to find a direction through life. And so, you, you know, whether it's, it's even if you're an atheist, you look for some structure that explains everything to you, right? So I don't know. I mean, you know, the, you know, the sort of faith that some people have in, in, uh, you know, in, in, in liberal economy, right? Like, so literally the invisible hand of the market, right? I mean, I don't think it's very different from the invisible hand of God, right? Uh, and, and, and so forth, right? So what happens to 
Gaithon did that in a very difficult part of his life when he's shattered in a sense, he meets this man, right? Who is then able to explain his life to him, right? Um, uh, later on in the book, there's a there's a young man called Adil, right, um, who grows up in a tiny village in Bihar, who's again crushed by his economic cir circumstances, his caste circumstances, um, and then there's a um, kind of you know a Maoist rebel leader who shows up and who gives him that ideology, and suddenly uh, our young man finds. Uh, that explains what is happening to him, right? And he becomes a follower of that, right? And so I'm, I'm, I hope I don't sound contemptuous of people. All of us, I think, do this, right? In the large and the small, we want to find some meaning, right? Um, in, in our individual lives and in, on a larger cosmic level, right? Even on a metaphysical level. So I guess that's what go is going on with Guy Tonde. Right? And I have another question. I'm sure a lot of our students are uh, aspiring writers. So do you have any words of advice for um, young people who would like to start writing mm -hmm. or who would like to? Well, I mean, you know, this is going to seem really obvious, but I mean, this is what I tell my students, especially at the beginning of semesters is that obviously you must read a lot, right? But then at some point you have to start reading as a writer. Right. And what I mean by that is like what happens to me is that if I read a book that absolutely blows me away. Right. And what I mean by that is that when I read it, I'm completely sunk inside its universe. Right. That sort of waking dream. Uh, I can't see outside of that. I feel myself in it. That to me is an amazing aesthetic experience. Right. And so if I read the book again and again, slowly, then I'm I, it becomes possible possible for me to see how that structure, how the writer built that experience, right? And and so then this kind of analytic thing happens. And in workshops, right, if you're looking at a piece of fiction, and this is what you try and do, right? You talk about its effect on you, and then what is the craft that went in there, right? And I don't think it's writers. I think all artists um, do this, right? Um, and And so that's what happens to me, and then you have to start doing that. And the other thing you have to do is, write right <laughs> you just have to write uh and what i mean by that is you know I, I don't mean like you know i guess if you have the discipline and the space to write every day that's like often you know, always the advice given to young writers but you have to do it and keep doing it in order to, to be a writer right um, and it's very difficult i know sometimes especially when you're a student right you have the pressure of all the like hundreds of pages of reading that's teachers expect you to do, professors expect you to do, you have the exams coming, right? Um, and then, you know, also, I think in life itself, there are very, very few writers anywhere in the world who make a living off the writer, off the writing, right? Uh, the guy who writes Jack Reacher obviously is able to do that, but everybody else has second jobs, right? They have day jobs, right? And and then you write in addition to that. Um, so, so, Time, the time pressure is always there, but you have to somehow work your way around it and, and write. The, the, I mean, I think that that discipline is important. Thank you. Um, Vincenzo Lasando wanted to ask a question. Vincenzo, you with us? Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Hi. Sorry, Hi. I'm in the streets, so I, ho I hope you can hear me well. Um, I, I'm, I can uh, hear you. First of all, thank you very much for uh, the, the conversation you've had and for, the, for all the um, inspiration you, you give us, uh, students and writers. Uh, I mean, as a writer, um, I, I find it to be very inspiring. Um, what I wanted to ask uh, is, um, as an aspiring independent book publisher, so apart from writing, I have a project of uh, independent book uh, publishing. And matter of fact, right now I'm at a independent books fair. Um, so interesting occasion to talk about this. What I wanted to ask is, what is the state of independent book publishing in India? Um, like... 
uh, especially often um, independent publishing conveys a lot of political texts coming from young people, um, but not only of political matter, but a book itself is a political object. Um, mm. So I'm curious about what is the state of book publishing in India, especially mm. for young people who want to approach this, um, this, uh, this job, this year. Right. Oh, that's a really fascinating question. So, I mean, what I see is that English language publishing is dominated a lot by big international houses like, you know, um, Penguin and, you know, um, these, these kind of international big, big uh, projects. Um, there's much more, it seems to me, there's much more energy in independent publishing in the other languages, right? Like Hindi and Marathi and so forth. Um, partly it's because the, the, what happens in India is that, that even though the numbers of people who read in other languages is much larger, um, English is an aspirational language, right? So people who buy books, and especially the more expensive books, um, uh, the, everywhere from the lower, lower middle class upwards, they want to learn English because they see it as an economic ladder also. <clears throat> so so uh, there are smaller publishers in English as well, but from what I see from the outside is, is more, more money being present in, in, in English, right, in larger publishers. Um, I do have a very good friend, um, Chiki Sarkar, who was an editor at Penguin, my editor at Penguin, and she went off and it, it was, it's basically a startup, right? She raised uh, venture capital funds, which she was able to do because of her track record at Penguin. And she founded a publishing company called Juggernaut. And what they're doing is very interesting. They were very successful in, you know, doing eBooks. Um, so that's been something really interesting for me to watch is that, um, I, I guess you could call that independent publishing in the sense that it's startup like, right? Uh, but I do agree that the, the that indie publishers are able to do more um, stuff that is off the beaten path, right? Um, anyway, I, 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 I'm not being very clear or informative here, I think, uh, but in, in response to your question about uh, what is the state? I think the state of independent publishing is much healthier in, uh, and there are more of them in the regional languages, right? Uh, uh, I should say also that that uh, my first two books, uh, Red Earth and Pouring Rain and Love and Longing in Bombay, the, the Italian translations of them were published by Yanni Borgo, uh, who ran this small publishing house called Instar Libri. I don't know if you young people will know of that, but um, Yanni's whole thing was that he produced these incredibly beautiful books, right? And what I mean by that is they were beautiful as objects, right? So they would be, it, it, they looked like, you know, something that went back um, to the 18th century or the 16th century, where the book was produced to be not just an excellent reading experience, it was meant to be beautiful in itself, right? And I, I mean, now looking back, I thought, I think it's a very interesting example of maybe how an indie publisher um, is able to, um, is able to be distinct, right? Um, in terms of book as political object, right? I guess you could think of those as luxury items. Um, if you haven't seen his books, I'm sure they're present in some libraries, you should go find them. Um, and then in the States, my last book, which is nonfiction, called Geek Sublime was published by a very small company called Grey Wolf. And Grey Wolf is tiny, but it punches far above its weight. Their books all you know, win awards every year. Um, they, they won the, uh, their writers have won the, the most um, uh, prestigious awards like the Pulitzer and so forth um, in the United States. Um, and they, interestingly enough, are a nonprofit. 
right? And their stated mission is to publish books that um, otherwise would not get published, right? And so that Geek Sublime is a really weird book, right? It's about computer programming and pre-modern Indian aesthetic theory. So, so it fit in perfectly with that, and they did a fantastic job of uh, of putting it out in the market, right? Um, Thanks for that, um, uh, Vincenzo. Does that answer your question? And uh, I we have one question from Professor Cavaliere. Then I'll go back to ask you about this thing about pre-modern aesthetics because we do a lot of a bit of variety and. Oh, wow. uh, so at the university, we don't have our Sanskrit professor Svera, but Professor Cavalieri, if I'm not mistaken, did a PhD thesis on aesthetics and of oh, wow. so, uh, I'll, 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 I'll give it over to Stefania first, and then we have a question from Rakesh Kumar. I hope it's not it's not too late. I can um, no. make a small question. Uh, first of all, thank you very much again. I'm uh, I was very happy to. Um, to have you here and uh, to have the opportunity of uh, listening to your um, to this discussion, I have a small question. Then maybe I will uh, come later for the some some thanks. Um, the question is uh, um, connected to what we said about uh, titles, titles, mm -hmm. inspiring titles, evocative titles of the uh, Netflix episodes, uh, and then. Uh, which were really uh, very inspiring to me. And then I went back. I remember that also in uh, Love and Longing in Mumbai, you, mm -hmm. in, uh, in Bombay, you, you yeah. chose some very special titles uh, for your uh, stories because are these mm -hmm. uh, uh, Arta Dharma and uh, Kama, and then you add uh, Shanti and uh, Shakti. So <laughs> some very deeply uh, religious cultural uh, element titles. So I was wondering whether, as you were already mentioning, it's something that is uh, somehow uh, unconscious, unconsciously uh, present in the mindset that guides uh, uh, that guides you, or is uh, something to which uh, uh, that you cannot overlook when you make literature mm, in India. Right. No, I mean I think both. Right. So that, I mean, you know, the first book, Red Earth and Pouring Rain, uh, you know, does this um, this old model, storytelling model in India, which is stories within stories within stories within stories, right, which I've always enjoyed. And so, uh, again, when I started, I didn't know it was going to do that. But then, like, very early in the first chapter, it became obvious that that's what it's going to do. Um, and then, you know, like you said, in Love and Longing, there are these... Um, very old ancient principles, right? It's very explicitly stated that people have four aims in life, right? Dharma, which is kind of duty, um, religious duty, um, artha, which is, you know, economic gain or earning because you have to feed yourself and your family and others, kama, which is pleasure. And that refers not just to sexual pleasure, but aesthetic pleasure, all kind. And then finally, moksha, right? Which is liberation. And you can't get to liberation without doing all of the other three, right? Uh, so, you know, again, like you said, these are very present as knowledge, but also as a sediment, right, in Indian culture, right? And often explicitly talked about. So in my head, when I was writing that book, I, you know, I wanted to see how do you take that, that principle, which often is very abstractly stated, Right. So the, the scriptures and the philosophers will say, you know, these are the reasons why you want to have um, artha or kama. But, you know, I wanted to see that how it's embodied in human lives. Right. Um, in ordinary human lives. And so the tension between the abstraction and the reality. Right. The lived experience was what interested me. Right. In that book. Um, and so, yeah, both in storytelling structure and then in thinking, that's been one of the, I guess, the tensions of my life. And I think all writers repeat themselves in terms of their obsessions, right? Like, you know, we, Dickens um, writes about childhood trauma, right? Again and again and again, right? So I suppose somewhere, like, maybe it's connected to my traumas through my life, my childhood trauma. So that's why it keeps coming up. Thank you. Uh, 
two quick comments both gentlemen are not able to uh, use uh, voice and video so rakesh kumar who's a phd student from delhi who's actually doing his uh, phd on a translation of primo levi to hindi says he sends you his warm greetings and he asks you about your source of creativity he says what i believe is that a writer is similar to brahma who creates an entire universe on paper and decides the fate of their characters thanks <laughs> yes yeah you know i don't know right where it comes from you know i can tell you that um i've been telling stories all my life right and you know before i mean they've been very important right so i remember before i even could read my aunts and my mother telling me these stories from the epics right which often happens right um and then i was a very strange little kid i was introverted so i would spend you know i would build these epic stories in my head that would continue from day to day right and so i lived in that universe as well and um i started writing down um fiction of my own short stories very early right i think like around 11 and 12 and at that point i was writing um a lot of sci-fi influenced by american sci-fi writers right isaac asimov and arthur c clarke and then one of my friends saw me doing this and he said you should give this to the school magazine which was run by students and um, you know they started getting published there and that was really exciting right you kind of get the bug so i don't know right like my nephew for instance he like he's been an obsessive cricketer since he was 3 or 4 right so i think we have these predilections that come with us i, I suppose you could say in reincarn if you believe in reincarnation that it's all these memories and this experience you've been accumulating over many lives right and that's what like the abhinava gupta would say right <laughs> these vasanas these these memory traces don't just exist in one life they exist over several lives right so i i have to say rakesh that i i don't know really but but i feel it coming from somewhere else right not just my conscious mind Uh, oh, and i should say yeah you are the god of your world although you're also its slave right like i i think i've been saying this too much maybe that i don't quite know where it comes from but it is possible for me to kill off a character i tell my students all the time right like in a short story especially there's a certain economy of characters right and if your protagonist aunt is showing up or their uncle is showing up again and again maybe once here and once in the middle and they're just a little tiny walk on I just tell them just kill that character off you don't need them here right <laughs> just like you can even put in a story about the how the uncle was killed in a traffic accident right if you really need the memory of that uncle but otherwise just get rid of them uh I have to read uh, Geek Sublime because now 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 you have your you know you've piqued our interest because uh we're actually doing a festival um in June uh, which is going to focus on pre-modern aesthetics Oh, right. uh, and we have uh, uh, professor shulman coming in from um hebrew university and it's something oh. that sanya is leading so oh you guys are so lucky he was here at berkeley and i sat in on one of his seminars amazing he's a, such an amazing person oh and i should say geek sublime has been translated into italian although your students don't need that i can't remember what they called it i'm sorry but it is available in, in italian Perfect. Uh, last questions before we thank you. I mean, uh, we've uh, it's been an hour, fifteen minutes. I promised you we wouldn't go above an hour. So, uh, any last questions before we um, have the word of thanks? Okay, doesn't seem like it. So that was my last call. Stefania, if you could please, uh, before I conclude. Yes, uh, I would like to make my personal thanks uh, to Vikram Chandra for uh, having accepted this uh, invitation, which I know is something uh, very rare. Uh, so I'm really uh, happy, pleased, and honored that he could be um, with us tonight. And uh, I'm uh, very happy, very uh, thankful also, also to um, Vas Chenoy of uh, Association Associazione Sakshi for having for making it possible. So uh, thank you very much for. Personally, I would like to thank you, Vikram um, Chandra, because uh, he has, has uh, obviously, I'm also a great fan of his books, and uh, uh, his uh, his literature is a, 
uh, yeah, his books are part of, uh, uh, of, the of the imagination of India that all the people who didn't have the luck of growing up in Mumbai, in Mumbai, in <laughs> Mumbai uh, um, uh, have. So uh, thanks to his book, we, uh, we had the first, uh, at least for me, it was the first one of the first windows uh, on uh, India and on the city of Bombay. So it, uh, uh, it's uh, full of inspiring uh, suggestions and uh, um, they offer, uh, they, they offer um, a, a portrait of the uh, cultural, of the rich cultural landscape of contemporary India. So for me, uh, uh, it was a great pleasure and honor. And then I have to make some uh, thanks on behalf of the University L'Orientale uh, and of the um, uh, Center for uh, South and Southeast Asian Studies uh, uh, to which I belong because uh, this, uh, for, for this lecture and uh, for, um, for, because the, uh, the, the topic of the lecture is uh, one of the uh, main mm, focus of interest of our studies that, uh, are, uh, um, that concentrate on uh, Indian culture, literature, and, uh, and so on. But also it's very important to have become Chandra for the old university because we have uh, um, many uh, colleagues uh, studying uh, Indian English and uh, um, uh, proposing courses of uh, um, creative writing. So it, has, uh, it was a very uh, special occasion for all of us and we are happy and honored and uh, we are waiting for you uh, in uh, uh, Napoli. So we will uh, looking forward to welcome you in person soon. Thank you. I would I would love to come. I mean, I, it's one of my favorite places in the world. Um, and I need to come anyway, because I, we never, we didn't talk about this, but as you know, there's very ancient collect, uh, connections between Italy and India, yep. going back all the way to the first century CE, right? And, and there's a couple of sites that I need to go <laughs> to in Southern Italy that I would love to come for. It. So please let us know and we'll arrange and uh, wait for you also here. Okay. We'd love thank to host you. you in person and thank you again for making the time. I'm honored that this is the only talk you did this year. So uh, we, we have the wonderful sea in front of us. You're, you're heavily missed in Naples and we hope that we can see you in person the next time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said, I mean, we didn't also talk about Inspector Montalbano. <laughs> oh, of course. But that without a bottle of wine is, I think, yes, yes. you know, it's... it's yeah. We, we need yeah. to have the bottle of wine open and that that's a conversation that needs to happen on that bottle. right right i was i was thinking actually that there needs to be a series about sartaj comes to italy yep. to investigate something and I, I, he actually, becomes partners with the inspector <laughs> some of my uh, dear friends who are uh, italian friends are now directors of um, web series here in italy and one of them is also directed diavoli which is Devils, which is this thing that the uh, guys from Grey's Anatomy is doing with it's an Italo Anglo Saxon uh, thriller again based on stock market manipulation, etc. So, oh, oh. Uh, I'm actually trying to work a lot with Sakshi and the Orientale to get Bollywood involved with Italy to try and make stuff here. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we're actually planning a, a small kind of a Film summit, film web series summit. If we're able to get people together, uh, oh, we, we have the Italian National Producers Association, Digital Content Producers Association. Now they're called. They're they're like the Film Producers Association, the Motion Pictures Producers Association in India and the US. So they've they've agreed to work with us on it. Now let's see how how okay. successful right. that is. But but the idea right. is to actually you know get a character like Sartaj Singh to get I don't know a very good looking Italian. Uh, female That's, detective and uh, right. go looking for hidden money somewhere or something like that. I'll, I'll leave the creativity to you. I'll, okay. I, I, I provide wine and I essentially accompany. I, I'm, 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 I'm on for the rides. So. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for giving me the time. Thanks for making the time and yeah. uh, have a good weekend. Yeah. Okay.